thanks for coming out on this rainy night. Um, I'm going to be interested to see how long this talk runs because I have a lot of stuff to show, but I'll try to keep a steady pace. Um, I do want to thank Sasha and Kara and Tepe Cooper and the Valence Center Cooper Union for having me. Uh, as Sasha mentioned, I went through the uh, Tepe Cooper program the first year that they had it. Actually, I helped them a little bit to set up the program. Um, and now I'm uh, still involved and helping with the type of graphics uh, conference and festival um, and so it's really at all the talks that are coming up I'm really excited about so it's kind of an honor for me to be uh, on the same list of talks as everyone else um, so let's get into it here um, as Sasha mentioned I run a company called Hex Projects um, where I make fonts and websites. Uh, right now, the website mostly is just showing fonts. There's a lot of fonts that are not 100% complete. Some of them you can buy um, from Future Fonts. Some of them, if you want to use them, you can write me an email. I'm always happy to have uh, excuses to keep working on the fonts. Um, also, as Sasha mentioned, I am a co-founder of Fonts in Use. Um, actually, I'm curious, maybe a quick raise of hands, how many people have been to Fonts in Use before? Oh. That's a lot of people. That's more than I thought. Uh, well, just as I was leaving uh, my house, I looked at Fonts in Use, as I do every half hour or so, and I saw that my colleagues there uh, have been dumping a whole bunch of Franklin Gothic content on the homepage, so check it out when, after this is done. Um, if you're not familiar with Fonts in Use, it's a place where we catalog examples of Fonts in Use. Um, everything from old baseball cards, to movie posters, to websites, to digital apps, anything that uses a font, which is uh, almost all graphic design. Um, and it's cataloged by topics and with tags about um, the style of the typography and information about whatever the thing uh, is. Of course, there's also a lot of information there about the fonts themselves. <clears throat> I think this is maybe one of the underappreciated aspects of the site um, because it has historical info, but also links to other related typefaces, either typefaces that kind of have a similar style or are historically related um, with links out to specimens and places to buy the fonts. <clears throat> Again, uh, I've been working with Cooper Union on the typographics program every year. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit more, uh, the last year's website specifically, but quick summary is that uh, so far every year I've been building the website um, and doing a lot of the design work um, on my own uh, with some help from uh, other students and uh, my colleague Mark who's working here at Cooper Union um, and Sasha of course is giving input, Kara. It's a really great Experience. If you've never been to typographics, uh, check it out. <clears throat> so to the topic at hand, this quote is where I got the title of this talk. Um, it comes from a guy named Steve Watts, who was uh, the Type Foundry supervisor at the American Type Founders Company. Uh, he worked there from 1919 until 1955, so quite a long time. Um, and basically, what it, what he's saying is uh, Franklin Gothic is kind of an indestructible typeface. It's come and gone through different uh, trends and different periods of time and fashion, um, but it still uh, keeps on going. People keep using it in different and interesting ways. <coughs> Excuse me. But you might be asking, what exactly does Franklin Gothic mean? Um, because it's so close to Halloween, I, I actually, we originally had this talk scheduled on Halloween, and I was joking that I should come dressed up like this Franklin Gothic man. Uh, I've been Franklin with some, some goth makeup on it. But I opted to uh, move it move it up a little, um, so unfortunately you don't get to see me in Gothic. Uh, the Franklin in Franklin Gothic, though, does refer to Benjamin Franklin, um, who, other than being a politician, was um, a printer. Um, his brother founded one of the earliest newspapers in America, um, and Ben Franklin worked there setting type. 
Uh, he later ran his own presses. Um, he had correspondence with Baskerville about his types. Um, so he was very much in, in the world of printing and typography. Um, <clears throat> he was also one of the people who was essentially sent on a press check when they printed the first version of the uh, Declaration of Independence. It's called the Dunlap Broadside. Um, just a fun little fact. So that's the Franklin part. Gothic is a little more mysterious. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, the term Gothic was first used for to describe a typeface to basically mean sans serif um, in 1837, I think it was, from the Boston Type Foundry. This is the typeface in question. It's just called Gothic, and you can see it has uh, the different sizes um, for, for each of uh, the kind of sets of metal type. And you'll also notice that the differences between the sizes uh, are slightly different because they were all uh, cut by hand at that exact size. Um, we'll get, get into that again later. But basically, that, as far as I know, that's the first time the term Gothic was used for uh, describing a sans serif typeface. Um, and that's uh, Franklin Gothic uh, comes from that tradition of sans serifs. Uh, it was first released at the turn of the 20th century, in 1902, um, with just a handful of styles, and it never really um, grew to many more than a handful of styles. Um, well, there are some exceptions, we'll get into that later, but um, essentially there was the normal width, the condensed, and the extra condensed, and that's kind of the core of the Franklin Gothic type family. Um, there are no uh, named weights from the original release from the American Type Founders Company, um, but there are other related typefaces. Uh, since this is so close to Halloween now, I did want to do some Halloween-y stuff. Uh, so I've kind of organized this talk according to this easy-to-follow photo guide from a cool magazine I have. It's all about doing your own uh, monster makeup. I always really like this, this kid in the, uh, on the cover. And so this is, in some ways, this is how I'm going to explain my uh, love affair with Franklin Gothic and how it's gradually grown and grown and turned me into a kind of a weirdo Franklin Gothic monster. <laughs> and so let's start at the beginning here. Um, with When I first uh, noticed Franklin Gothic, or even how I came to first notice it. Um, when I was growing up in Massachusetts in the 1990s, I was a little punk rocker. Uh, this is when I was 11 or 12. Uh, you can't see here, but my arm's broken from skateboarding accident. It's kind of like pinned to my jacket there. Um, so I was, yeah, listening to punk music, skateboarding, um, and I don't know if I really even realized it at the time, but a lot of my favorite records, um, when, when I was very impressionable and just learning about punk rock music, um, were using Franklin Gothic and using it uh, quite prominently. Um, and it, it's almost surprising how uh, consistent this is for uh, a number of albums. This is the first Ramones record from 1976, uh, probably designed by Arturo Vega, who was kind of the fifth Ramone. He was the, the art director for the Ramones. For decades. Um, and this album in particular, uh, I think it must have really kind of flipped a switch in my brain because it's one of my favorite albums of all time. And this typeface, which is uh, Franklin Gothic Extra Condensed, became one of my favorite typefaces of all time. Or this might actually be just condensed. Um, uh, this is for the first EP from Iron Threat. It's probably designed uh, by Jeff Nelson, who was a member of the band, um, but they also used it on other albums, uh, like the Complete Discography, which is what where I first encountered it. Um, I'm pretty sure this was set with Leprosat type. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, from the same record label, there was this compilation called Flex Your Head that came out in 1982. Uh, and this is the back cover of it. 
Um, and I always really loved the design at the time, and I never really understood why, but I, I'm pretty sure it was because of this extra condensed Franklin Gothic and the kind of like off kilter, um, not fully mechanical type setting of it. Also, it's a great album. Uh, similarly, this, these are all kind of in the same era, 19, early 1980s, 1982. The Descendants, also a very, um, uh, I wouldn't say life changing, but I guess in some ways life changing. It, it, kind of changed my ideas about what punk rock was and could be. Um, uh, and then similarly, more, more locally, there was this band called the FUs um, from Boston. And uh, I think I mostly liked the illustration on this, which is from an illustrator named Busthead. But still, it's got some Franklin Gothic, so I had to throw it in the top. Um, I could keep going on and on. I'll, I'll just do a couple more here. Uh, this one is Band Infest. This is more late 80s, 1988. Um, I discovered Infest uh, much later, but uh, they still uh, uh, took a hold on me. This album, again, uh, it just used Franklin Gothic so prominently I had to, to throw it in the mix here. But uh, one thing I wanted to talk a little bit more about was this idea of kind of DIY production techniques and specifically rub down lettering. This is a letter set sheet. And if you're not familiar with it, the way it works is essentially you put the sheet of letters over a piece of paper and you rub it down and the, one of the letters will transfer onto the paper and then you move the sheet and repeat. And that's probably how a good number of these examples um, were first applied. I was using similar kind of techniques um, uh, photocopiers, even my, my mom's typewriter that she had for work. This is a, a tape cover for one of my first bands called The Monsters. I think I was 12 years old or something when I made this. Um, and I remember kind of sitting at my mom's work and trying to figure out how to print on two sides of a piece of paper and make it line up. And uh, that's something I still struggle with today. Um, but as you can see, it's very lo-fi. Uh, when I look at it now, it looks like something that was intentionally messed up to make it look more punk, but I assure you that I was trying to make it as clean as I possibly could. Um, this one I was pretty proud of. The, the labels for that tape, uh, we wanted them to be orange. And actually, this, uh, this tape was released, it was, I think, the anniversary of the release of this will be tomorrow. I don't even, I'm not even going to try to think of how many years ago that was, but um, we wanted orange stickers on the tape, but we didn't have orange paper, so we spray painted it, and every single tape was typed on a typewriter by hand, so it's very, very lo-fi. Of course, when you're a band, you have to start making merch and other kinds of uh, graphic products, uh, so of course I was making flyers. Um, this was probably also when I was about 13 or maybe 14. Um, yeah, again, just lo-fi, like cutting out logos of bands that I have like a sticker from and using it, otherwise drawing it by hand. It's uh, kind of amazing how much things have changed now. Of course, trying to be as, as provocative as possible. Um, this was one of the bigger shows that we played, um, but these shows were all happening at like small VFW halls, um, organized by either our friends or sometimes our friends' moms, um, or even our own moms, um, because the VFW hall wouldn't let us rent out the hall, you know, as some 13-year-old punk rocker kid. I can't say that I would rent the hall out to that kid with the spiky blonde hair either. Um, but actually, the uh, production technique that kind of uh, sent me down a real rabbit hole with Franklin Gothic wasn't Letraset, it was these vinyl uh, adhesive stickers. And I don't know if you've ever used these before, but it's pretty self-explanatory. You peel off the letter and you stick them down. And so, of course, I was making uh, tapes, and when you're only producing like 10 or 15 tapes for your friends, <coughs> It's not a problem to 
stick them all down by hand um, and use just like you know the generic blank tape that you get at CVS or whatever. Um, but this was right around the time where uh, I started going to uh, graphic arts high school. It was a, a technical high school, and I was in the graphic arts department. Um, and there was something uh, Franklin related there that actually wasn't part of my graphic arts training, but it was in my science class. Uh, they played this movie, Powers of Ten, which uh, if you haven't watched it, it's really cool. It's made by uh, Ray and Charles Eames, and the general idea is it zooms way out on the Earth, and then zooms way back in and talks about all the stuff you're seeing along the way. But all the titling, at least in the, the beginning and the end of the film, is set in all caps, condensed Franklin. And this is really when, like, not, not only just Franklin Gothic, but specifically extra condensed uh, Franklin Gothic kind of uh, took hold in my brain. Um, these are a little bit later, like uh, I actually found these on an old hard drive and was astounded. This is, again, from high school. I never thought I would see this little, uh, as you can see, it's very pixelated because I had to make them that small when I was emailing them in 2001 or 2000, whenever this was. Um, but again, Franklin Gothic condensed more flyers. This is now, I've kind of, since I was at uh, it's graphic arts program in high school, I started learning to use computer and, of course, Franklin Gothic there. And then, if you want to get really advanced, I started making some plain letters, Franklin Gothic. <laughs> uh, I was quite proud of myself. This, I think, was my second year of high school. I'm, I'm now probably boring you with all my personal stories about Franklin Gothic, but the last one I want to mention is just this other band that I was in called 8-Bit. Um, that was later in high school, and it's kind of a return back after I'd been using the computer for a while. I uh, discovered that they had a wax roller at my high school, and I really got into cutting things out with wax and using. Um, I did use Letraset for the logo, um, and kind of doing it all manually with paste up that way. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, kind of Franklin Gothic had seeped into my blood by this point, so I started seeing it everywhere I went, and this has not changed, it's only gotten quite worse. You'll see it uh, in full force as we go through this talk. Um, but that's now complete step one of the process of becoming a Franklin Gothic monster. Um, so once you uh, start being interested in anything, of course you want to learn more about it. The same uh, was true with all my music and skateboarding and, of course, design. So when I was in uh, college, going to a graphic design program at MassArt, and then also uh, later after college just doing my own research, um, I wanted to learn more about Franklin Gothic and where it came from. And, like, what's the deal? Why is it that sometimes it looks good and I like the way it looks and sometimes it doesn't? Um, and I'm I'm not going to pretend as though this is a very linear story of how I learned things, um, but it's just how I organized it to uh, explain a short, short history to you. I could do an entire talk on all the typefaces that came before Franklin Gothic that are somehow related or uh, predecessor. Um, but just suffice to say that in 1892, there were 30-something type foundries in the United States, and uh, at some point, they all decided, probably egged on with the competition from the new Linotype machine, that they had to band together and uh, become kind of a cohesive effort. And that's, so that's what they did in 1892. 23 foundries merged into what was then the largest and probably still the largest and uh, most advanced uh, type foundry at the time. Um, later, other large foundries that were kind of holdouts eventually merged into it too, and it was quite a large operation. Um, and some of the main people behind this were the Bentons. So this is Lynn Boyd Benton on the left, who was the director of ATF. Uh, he designed the Century typeface. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, but he was also an engineer, and he invented 
a machine that essentially uh, allowed people to cut typefaces at different sizes with a machine uh, using a pattern instead of doing it all by hand, um, which definitely helped clean up a lot of the irregularities that you would see in older uh, sans serif typefaces, or just typefaces in general. Um, the guy on the right is his son. His name is Morris Fuller Benton. He's kind of a personal hero of mine, uh, if for no other reason than he designed Franklin Gothic. Um, but so his job at ATF was to essentially, as you can imagine, when you have 23 or more foundries all merging into one, they have a lot of redundant typefaces in their catalog. And so it was up to Morris Fuller Benton to go through everything and pick what got to stay, what got to go. Sometimes different type families were merged into one type family if they were similar enough, um, which wasn't uncommon back then. Um, and then he also was in charge of essentially designing new typefaces using the technology that his uh, dad had invented and um, trying to meet the demands of the, the market at the time. Um, so yeah, in, when ATF became a company in 1892, they put out a specimen from all the different uh, type companies that were part of ATF then, and there was something like 40 or 50 uh, different sans serif families that were probably largely overlapping in style. Uh, the, there's a lot more I could say about these two guys, but they're really interesting. There's a book, if you're interested to learn more, from uh, Patricia Cost that I would recommend. It's uh, interesting both for type history but also uh, history of engineering and just kind of industry in the United States. Um, and so one of the typefaces that Morris Fuller Benton, as I mentioned, uh, produced in his job was Franklin Gothic. And at the time it was really kind of a pinnacle, I think, of all the previous sans serif typefaces that had that other companies had been working on kind of um, on and off and in small uh, chunks. There's a guy named Mac McGrew who wrote this book called American, Typefa American Metal Typefaces of the 20th Century, and he said Franklin Gothic might be the patriarch of modern American Gothics. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is. But first of all, let's kind of take a very close look at characteristic glyphs of um, Franklin Gothic. This, these four glyphs here hold a lot of the DNA that kind of carries through through the rest of the design. Um, so you see, compared to a lot of other sans serif typefaces like um, Futura or um, yeah, a, a lot of the more modernist typefaces that came a little bit later, um, there's kind of a slight contrast between the thick parts of the letters and the thin parts of the letters. Um, you also notice that the, the terminal, it's in the middle here, I know, uh, at the end of the E is not, it doesn't come all the way up to be at a right angle. Um, it's kind of uh, at a non-orthogonal angle. Um, and that carries out throughout the rest of the typeface as well. But probably the thing that, in my opinion, is, is really um, the core of the DNA of Franklin Gothic is the way that the uh, curved arches meet into the stem. Um, I wish I had a laser pointer or something so I could point it out here, but um, But basically where the curve comes out of the stem of the H or out of the P, it's, it's not a smooth connection. It comes out straight. And it's like, I, I call it a stab connection. I don't know if that's an actual legitimate term or not. But, um, and if you kind of look at uh, other glyphs in other uh, styles and widths, you can see some of this DNA kind of uh, percolating out. There's also some very characteristic glyphs, like the lowercase g has kind of an ear, um, looks like a little waggy dog ear or something. Um, but you also notice that as the, the design gets more condensed, those uh, angled terminals that we saw in the C before 
uh, start to become more uh, horizontal with the, the baseline. Uh, another interesting thing about Franklin Gothic is the C, both the uppercase and lowercase, are uh, slightly top heavy. So the top part ends in a thicker stroke than on the bottom, which is uh, fairly unusual. Usually they're either uh, about the same or sometimes slightly lighter. Um, but again, the, the contrast carries through. Uh, there's thick parts and thin parts, and kind of modulation in, in the width of the stroke, um, regardless of the width. So I mentioned before that there were the three kind of core styles of Franklin Gothic. Um, but actually, there, there are uh, a handful more. Uh, later on, a wide variant was added. Um, there was an italic pretty early on. And then a condensed italic came in the 50s. Um, but this is pretty much the family here. There's also like some kind of <coughs> ornamented variants that have stripes in it or you know, uh, outline, drop shadow, whatever else. But this is pretty much it, which is kind of impressive when you think of how popular Franklin Gothic is. Um, but part of the reason that that is, is that Franklin Gothic isn't just a family on its own. Um, ATF it themselves marketed Franklin Gothic as part of the ATF Gothic family. Um, so you can see here there's also News Gothic, um, Alternate Gothic, Monotone Gothic, Lightline Gothic, um, and these created kind of a, an ad hoc um, extended family of typefaces that were either intended to work well together or just happened to work quite well together. So you can, here's another um, kind of visualization of this. This, <laughs> this table is a little weird because the headings sometimes are content and sometimes not, but it shows all the styles. I think the only style that's missing here the, that really matters is the condensed italic. Um, but you can see kind of how all these different typefaces even though they have different names, they have kind of a similar underlying uh, structure or design aesthetic. As uh, Mac McGrew said, this group of typefaces, which uh, ATF called the ATF Gothic <coughs> family, uh, a lot of them are more similar um, than some of the other typefaces I talked about, especially the kind of early typefaces where each size was being cut by hand and there were a lot of irregularities between sizes and uh, different styles. Um, because ATF was using this uh, machine that helped to keep things consistent, uh, it really helped to also keep the larger family of typefaces consistent. Probably the least similar to Franklin Gothic, though still pretty similar, is Alternate Gothic. Um, and uh, you'll notice that Unlike a lot of sans serif typefaces, when the uh, round glyphs get narrow, so the C, the G, the O, um, the, the size of the glyphs still remain round. They don't become straight. Um, and, but that is the case with alternate Gothic. You'll see like the D or the O or the C, uh, when, when they kind of reach a certain point, they go straight for a while and then uh, start curving again. So this makes it a little, that's the most noticeable difference from Franklin Gothic. Otherwise there's a lot of kind of similar, um, yeah, just uh, uh, contrast and style in general. Things getting, start getting a little more interesting when you look at the very light uh, members of this extended ATF Gothic family, and specifically Lightline. To my eye, Lightline looks basically just like uh, condensed Franklin Gothic, but very light. Um, there are subtle differences, like the uh, middle of the M doesn't reach all the way down to the baseline. But other than that, it's uh, they have. It looks almost like the skeleton version of Franklin Gothic. Um, monotone Gothic, a little less so. It's slightly wide, um, tightly spaced, um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that might be coming up. But really, the the, the sibling that's closest to Franklin Gothic in this extended family is News Gothic. 
And this is something that um, I had been aware of for a long time. I think even in uh, my college classes, we had been taught that Franklin Gothic's lighter weight sibling was News Gothic. Um, and I figured, you know, they're from the same foundry, they have the same designer, uh, of course they're going to have some similar DNA. Um, but I never really looked too close at it. And as far as I can tell, a lot of people have not looked very close at this relationship because even in reading kind of scholarly articles about um, Franklin Gothic, I'll see Frank, uh, News Gothic only mentioned kind of in passing. But when you really like uh, get them large and up next to each other, you can really start to see the similarities, the same kind of structure, especially in the more characteristic glyphs like the G um, or the Q or the R, um, and especially when you get into the lowercase. Um, to me, again, it's almost like a like a skeleton version of Franklin Gothic. So I have these, uh, these scans are from this, this box of cards I have that show all the glyphs from a bunch of different ATF typefaces. Um, and I was like, well, how, how similar are these really, like if I overlaid them? So that's exactly what I did. And I had to nudge things around a little bit to get each glyph kind of centered with the corresponding glyph and the other style. Um, and, but what you're seeing here basically is that News Gothic is in red and Franklin Gothic is in blue, and the differences uh, in weight are very consistent between from glyph to glyph. It, it looks almost like in the uppercase they're tr trying to match the width of the glyphs exactly in many cases. Um, and if it was just one or two glyphs that matched dead on, I would say, okay, that's coincidence. But when you look at it like this, it seems like it was a very intentional uh, kind of reversal of weight to get at uh, what became News Gothic. Um, same in, in the lowercase. Of course, there are some glyphs that you can't just remove weight from all the way around and expect them to, to function uh, properly. But uh, when, I, when I saw this, this is when I really started thinking about how this this might kind of play out in a kind of a more modernized way. Um, but before we get to that, that's much later in the talk, um, I should also mention that there were many different versions of Franklin Gothic, um, even kind of in the pre-digital and pre-phototype era. This is a Ludlow's version of Franklin Gothic. And this is, I like to use this as an example of um, and actually, the next example is even better, but uh, a lot of times there's a confusion between what a font is and what a typeface is, and a lot of times it really doesn't matter, to be honest. But this is an example where if you look at the R from uh, Ludlow's Franklin Gothic, it's much different than the R. You can see it here. This is the Ludlow R, and then the normal R is up here. The leg kind of attaches much closer to the, the main upright stem. Um, so that was just another company that had a different type setting uh, technology that uh, probably licensed the rights to make their own version of uh, Franklin Gothic. And this was very common in the, the era of letterpress printing. Uh, one example I really like, because it's so bad, is this one from the Hamilton Wood Type Company. Um, I'm a little reluctant to talk trash on the Hamilton Wood Type Company because I have a relationship now with what is the Hamilton Wood Type Museum in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. But if you look at a lot of their mid 20th century adaptations of popular typefaces for wood, uh, you start seeing, especially when you look really close, the curves are just look like they were cut with a hacksaw. It's, uh, you also notice like the C is kind of curving in on itself, which is more of a British thing. Same with the S. Uh, there's a lot going on here, and I'm not going to go through it all, but it just goes to show that sometimes a different font of the same typeface can mean the difference between getting something that looks nice and something that does not look nice. Um, another company that had a lot of versions of Franklin Gothic was this company uh, that was based here in New York called Photo Lettering Incorporated. And they basically had a 
photographic typesetting uh, process where you would order a headline from them and they would typeset it with their extremely large uh, catalog of different type styles or alphabets as they called them. And they had dozens of different variants of Franklin Gothic and they were coming from different places, some were designed by different people, some of them were part of like a sub-series, some of them had numbers, like there was, uh, let me see here, Franconia, Cartusca Franklin Gothic 10, Pete Dong Franklin Gothic, there's a lot of them, and this is just one page of many. Um, if you've ever seen a, a photo lettering catalog, it's, it's kind of overwhelming because there's just so much stuff to look at. If you ever get a chance to go to Lou Bowen Center and uh, have a peek at one of these, if you haven't already. So they, they were making a lot of different Franklin kind of variants, and they even had kind of uh, a subset called Franklin Graphic, which was a more cohesive set with numbers uh, for the different weights um, that were much more finely tuned, um, like between one number and the next, it would be just a slight difference. They even used Franklin Gothic in some of their marketing material. This is a little specimen book I have, um, and I just love the design of this. This was designed by Ed Ben Gett. Um, but something I want to point out here and to keep an eye out for in the future is this lowercase g in big, and how the kind of ear on that is really even more exaggerated than uh, in the original Franklin Gothic that we were looking at earlier. So just keep that in mind as we go forward. But so this is where my uh, Franklin Gothic monster urges really, I was like starting to shapeshift because I decided I would make a spreadsheet of all the different Franklin Gothic variants that photo lettering has. And there are different catalogs with all the information about page numbers and they have codes for, you know, if it's an original design or if they have a miniature showing of it in the back of one of their books. Um, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to show you all of that, but, and this is just the Franklin Gothic related things that I looked at in their book. They also have just as many news Gothic interpretations, um, and in fact, a lot of their news Gothic interpretations, this is from, uh, I think volume two of their, their big catalog, has these little tiny showings of the alphabets in the back including the alternate glyphs that they have for that alphabet. So you can see in this, there's two different capital S's. There's at least two different lowercase a's, two f's. A lot of the alternates are made to make the typeface look a little bit more kind of Helvetica-ish. Um, the terminals end up being more upright than at an angle. So there's still a lot more of Franklin Gothic and News Gothic and the whole ATF Gothic family um, that I know is out there and I'm, I've been trying to hold off digging into it, but this talk hasn't helped me very much. Up until today I was still making scans of books and things like that. Um, in the digital era, this is probably the, the version of Franklin Gothic that I first uh, used as a digital font. Uh, it was digitized by a blindotype company, uh, which is a whole other story about why that is. But um, something I always took for granted was that uh, for some reason in this version, Franklin Gothic is referred to as Franklin Gothic number two, but all the, uh, the condensed and extra condensed styles um, are just normal Franklin Gothic. Um, and it wasn't until actually I started thinking about putting together info for this talk that uh, I became curious about wh where that even came from. So I emailed all kinds of people who are smarter than me and know more about the American Type Founding Company. Um, and it was uh, even Patricia Cost who wrote the book about the Bentons that I told you about before, um, Matthew Carter, uh, Frank Romano, a lot of kind of type historians that uh, I would hope, ha I had hoped would know, uh, who kind of had suggestions but weren't quite sure. Um, and then uh, a friend of mine, Paul Shaw, mentioned that it might have something to do 
with a practice that they used at ATF for using numbers for different kind of variants similar to alternate Gothic, which I showed you earlier. Um, so I started looking at uh, if that was the case, uh, and that was not the case. Um, but then I found this 1987 catalog from the Mergenthaler Type Library, uh, the digital typeface directory. Uh, and these two samples were shown next to each other. Uh, and I can't tell you how long I just stared at them saying, what? what's going on? Actually, I'm curious if anyone here who hasn't already seen something that I wrote about this can point out the things. If you can, I'll give you a free Franklin Gothic font. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out until basically I made the scan and overlay them, and you can just barely see it. And basically, the descenders for the P and the G and the J are, and the Y are slightly higher than the other ones. And that seems to be the answer, just slightly shorter descenders. Except for some reason the Q has the same length descender. I, I think that must be an error. And then also the one has like a slight difference in the, the flag of the one. Yeah, and you can barely even see it on the, on the slides here. But so this is like, I'm really starting to get into the rabbit hole here. But it only gets deeper. Whoa. <laughs> We're like, not even halfway through here. <laughs> uh, the next big kind of shift historically in the, the timeline of Franklin Gothic is, uh, comes from a company called ITC. And it stands for International Typeface Corporation. Probably if you've used fonts, you've heard of ITC Garamond or ITC this, ITC that. Um, ITC was a company also uh, founded here in New York um, by some of the people that also were involved with photo lettering. Um, so there's kind of a lot of crossover. Um, but they were known for kind of changing the way that um, type designers were compensated for their work. Instead of um, getting a one-time payment for a design that you did, you could get royalties from a font. So if your font starts going big gangbusters and ITC is selling a million copies, then you benefit from that. And that's really changed uh, the way the type industry worked quite a bit. Um, unfortunately and somewhat ironically, ITC has now kind of been put into zombie mode and is uh, run by a company that doesn't offer royalties for designers anymore, as far as I know. Anyways, ITC was very cool at the time. If you were a young graphic designer, you loved using ITC fonts in the 70s and 80s because they were slightly uh, funkier, or the people that were working on them a lot of times were lettering artists that had worked for photo lettering. Um, so they were, the designs were solid, but they were also interesting and new and better than just like whatever was in the metal type cabinet that you've been used to using for all of your career up until that point. They also changed a bit the, the idea. Um, a lot of times typefaces were designed for a specific typesetting technology, but ITC um, made it kind of a core part of their business that they would um, sell the design and uh, the artwork for the typeface, and then it was up to the company to uh, turn that artwork into the, the machinery needed to do typesetting. Um, but one of the, the typical approaches that ITC took for a typeface design was to essentially take uh, an existing historical typeface that had already proven itself popular and do their own kind of spin on it, uh, modernize it. Uh, they were uh, almost infamous for using extremely large X heights. So all the lowercase letters were uh, much larger than uh, they would have been in the original design. Um, and you can see it's kind of got more of like a 70s funky vibe um, than this uh, you know, older uh, historical typeface. It looks a little bit less dusty, especially in the context of the 1970s or early 1980s. <coughs> and so inevitably they got around to doing this with Franklin Gothic. Uh, this is uh, the March issue of 1980 for their promotional uh, 
publication, which was called UNLC. And this, I think UNLC was one of the big drivers of the popularity of ITC. It was basically they were publishing all kinds of cool articles about new fonts, and uh, the articles were all designed by really good designers. I think this cover was designed by Herb Allen. Um, and this is announcing their new version of uh, ITC Franklin Gothic. Uh, but you can see actually the, the kind of mentality of uh, bringing in designers from the world of photo lettering to design these layouts. Some of the glyphs are slightly changed, like you'll see in dissertation, the E is slightly narrower probably to make space so that they can justify the whole line. So there's a lot of like uh, minute trickery going on to get this solid block of text, but this style of spacing is very much in the wheelhouse of uh, ITC and UNLC and basically the style at the time. Um, ITC Franklin uh, was a new idea because it introduced for the first time a lighter weight version of Franklin that had the name Franklin. Um, so that there were four weights originally and then uh, they each had italic, and then I think there was also a handful of kind of uh, decorative styles, outline, uh, shadow, stuff like that. <clears throat> but when you look at uh, kind of the overall feeling of the typeface, it's a little more subtle than maybe the, the cobble example that I showed earlier, but it's definitely a slightly different flavor than the kind of old school original um, Franklin Gothic. And when you really start looking at why that is, you zoom in close, you'll see that the connections that I was talking about where the, the curve comes out from the stem, it's no longer kind of a stab coming out, it's more of a smooth connection, which is more how Helvetica worked. Of course, Helvetica was hugely popular at the time, as it always is, so this probably helped with the popularity of IC Franklin Gothic. Uh, when it first came out. And I agree, this it looks slightly kind of smoothed over. The, the angles, like on the lowercase e, um, aren't as, uh, the terminals aren't as angled. They're almost all the way upright. Um, so it's been slightly like Helvetica eyes and, and smoothed over. And I don't necessarily think that it's bad, but to me, it's not the, it doesn't have, it's kind of lost some of that Franklin sauce, uh, so to speak. <clears throat> and here again is that G that I told you to keep in the back of your mind. Now, I don't know if uh, the designer of IDC Franklin Gothic, who is Victor Caruso, I think he pronounced his name, um, I don't know if he was involved in any of the photo lettering versions of Franklin Gothic, but it seems that they've kind of adopted this very exaggerated, uh, goofy, here on the E. And this will come up again uh, over and over throughout history of Franklin Gothic now after ITC. <coughs> uh, Paul Shaw wrote a review of ITC Franklin Gothic in uh, the column he had called Flawed Typefaces for Imprint in 2010, May 2010, uh, basically saying that this G is really kind of getting in the way and starting to be distracting, especially if you're setting a paragraph of text, um, which you now, I mean, there is one of the styles is called ITC Franklin Gothic Book, so they're implying you can set this for kind of longer passages of text. If we look at kind of a side-by-side -side comparison of the original version, or at least a digital version of the original, and ITC Franklin Gothic, you can see that the differences are subtle. Probably most people who aren't graphic designers wouldn't, uh, they'd be looking at it the way we were looking at the two Franklin Gothics earlier. But you can see the weight is slightly heavier. There's a lighter weight, but then it's slightly lighter. Uh, the, so there isn't a style that matches the weight dead on. Um, again, the, the um, Curves coming out of the stems are no longer kind of stabbing into them. It's a, a smooth connection. And also kind of, I don't know how to describe this, but if you look at the lowercase h, it almost looks like it's a more of a round top than a kind of um, asymmetrical top. 
lowercase a of ITC Franklin Gothic always kind of annoyed me. I can't say why, but um, and then again, there's that that goofy ear. And I mean, when you look at the original Franklin Gothic, that ear is, I mean, to me it seems very characteristic, but when you see it in ITC Franklin Gothic, it really starts to scream. Again, the E, uh, the terminal is closer to being completely horizontal. Um, and I think overall it's just, uh, in some ways it feels like a caricature of Franklin Gothic, but not, it's like if you, Use Franklin Gothic with Helvetica and then crank it up to 10. That's what you get. So this was uh, released in 1980, um, but later on, uh, David Burlow uh, in 1991 um, added condensed and compressed and extra compressed widths, um, and they released this uh, through the Font Bureau Foundry. Uh, they also introduced these kind of Unicase variants that's like a lowercase letter at capital height. Um, and while this um, definitely makes the family more versatile as far as weights and widths and uh, functionality, there are still some things about it that uh, make it a little tricky to use. And I know this because I used it now almost 10 years ago uh, when Jessica Hish and I worked together on remaking the Type Directors Club website, and um, we were using ITC Franklin. Um, and it did most of what we needed, but I kept running into certain, uh, it wasn't even necessarily that I was running into things, it was that I wanted something and it wasn't there, or the weight that I wanted was either, like the options, one was either too heavy or too light, um, and sometimes things are just a little bit weird. Um, for this example, this is kind of the traditional Franklin Gothic extra condensed, um, which I think is great. It's like, that, that's the style that really does it for me. Um, but in ITC Franklin, uh, I feel like the weight is slightly too chunky. The crossbar, the A is a little high. Um, the C doesn't close in quite as much. Um, some of the glyphs close in more than others. Um, I don't want to be like talking trash on David Burlow's work. He's been working uh, at this way, way longer than I have. But I can say as a type user that these were things that I, I kept bumping into. So I, there's some validity to them. Um, another issue with it was the weight for text um, with so I should say that when ITC Franklin was released, this kind of expansion, the name was changed from ITC Franklin Gothic to just ITC Franklin, which is not confusing at all. <laughs> but it does help to differentiate between the two uh, variants because the designs are slightly different. Um, but with ITC Franklin and also with the older ITC Franklin Gothic, the I always... <coughs> was wanting for something between the options of light and medium. It wasn't like a nice regular uh, for, for normal text. Um, and so it works and you can definitely do what you need to with ITC Franklin, but I, after using it for a long time with the Type Directors Club, um, I kept wanting for more. Um, so now we're kind of entering into a new chapter where I'm going to talk not so much about uh, the typefaces uh, and the different variants, but just specifically about Franklin Gothic, mostly the original variant or kind of digitizations of that um, and how it kind of fits in the world of graphic design and, and typography in general. This quote is from Christian Schwartz, who's a typeface designer. He runs a commercial type. Um, and uh, this was actually from a typographics conference, I forget what year, maybe this was one of the early ones, and he was talking about Franklin Gothic as being kind of this quintessential American typeface, and I think it's true. It's, uh, it doesn't hurt that it uh, comes from the American Type Founders Company, but it's also a very uniquely and 
uh, somehow popularly American thing. It definitely hasn't been as popular in Europe or other parts of the world as far as I know. Um, but there are some people and companies that use uh, Friends in Gothic that I think really uh, know how to make it sing. Uh, one example is Blue Note Records and uh, Reed Miles, who is the designer there. And some of my favorite uses of Franklin Gothic are uh, from Blue Note. This is one of them. Uh, I can't really explain why. Uh, if you're not familiar with Blue Note Records, it's a jazz record company. Uh, put out a lot of kind of legendary albums uh, over the years, over many years. Um, but Reed Miles really uh, used Franklin Gothic and also Muse Gothic uh, very heavily and very creatively and kind of in interesting and fun ways. Um, this is one of my all-time favorites. Um, yeah, just experimenting with uh, putting type under smash glass, flipping it around, justifying it, letting people hold it, put it in boxes. Um, and then there was a string of time in the 60s where I don't know if he had a, a, a font made for this or if he was doing every single one by hand, but he did a series of albums where uh, the letters were all kind of chopped up and put together as though they're kind of like peeking out from behind a board. Um, there's a few examples, and they're they're all kind of slightly different. But it's an interesting technique, and I would be surprised if he kind of had some um, pre-cut letters or some way to to do this so that he didn't have to redo it every single time. I haven't like really dug in and um, examined things, but that'll be on my list of things to do. The other interesting thing about Franklin Gothic is the variety of different things that it's been used for and at how kind of appropriate it can seem in so such different uh, situations. This is a, a little example design that ATF made. This is 1917. This is a, a supplement to one of their um, type specimen books. Uh, and it's just so funny to read the text of a Mr. American, prepare to shoot, be prepared to defend your country. Of course, this is the middle of World War I, but uh, the design, uh, if you told me that was from 1960, I would not uh, second guess you. Um, similarly, militaristic, uh, Franklin Gothic is specified in the official uh, uniform and insignia standards for the US Army for name badges. So if your last name is, I think, longer than 11 characters or something, they have to use Franklin Gothic extra cadenced, <laughs> which seems kind of like arbitrary, but cool, I don't know, I like Franklin Gothic extra cadenced, so. Um, it's also been used on uh, Department of Defense kind of medical kit packaging. I really like these survival crackers. Uh, it has this just kind of like utilitarian, no nonsense. Um, yeah, I, mean, I don't know. It just seems like kind of funny in a way. On the flip side of the coin, uh, it's also been used in kind of the opposite context. This is a, a protest poster that was made in 1968 by uh, Billy Apple and Robert Coburn, um, and it's basically, you know, in, in the middle of the Vietnam War, uh, protesting, probably doing it at. Uh, draft card burning events and things like that. Also famously, this is one of my all-time favorite uses, Franklin Gothic, is uh, by John Lennon and Yoko Ono for their War is Over campaign. This is from, started in 1969, and basically their whole idea was to sell peace as though it was a commercial product, as though they were selling soap or any other thing that you probably don't really need. And it was all over the world on huge billboards, uh, they put leaflets everywhere, posters, um, and it's just so straightforward and simple. Um, and this has been now turned into a meme and you can probably find a million different variations that say, I know I've seen one that says like Trump is over, or I actually made one that said ITC is over with a, a version of Franklin Gothic I'm working on. Um, another power user, I would say, is uh, Daniel Gill at Alianza Editorial. Um, 
I don't really know much about this uh, publication house, um, mostly because they are publishing in English as far as I know, but I do know about the covers because I see them from time to time um, in bookstores. Uh, and I would also say that they are power users of Franklin Gothic. They use it quite a bit on a lot of their uh, covers, or at least they did. Um, and this one is interesting because it, it's using Franklin Gothic and News Gothic in exactly the way I showed earlier by overlaying them with kind of uh, matching widths and then having the kind of gradual transition between uh, the different styles. Um, and this really like flipped a switch in my brain and I started this like started to make me think about uh, how I might make my own version of Franklin Gothic. And I found that more like the more I look at old stuff from good designers who know how to use type well, the more ideas I get for making changes to a typeface that will make them more useful or uh, more interesting. It's another series from the same publisher. Um, I really like these gigantic chunky quotation marks and just the kind of like visual immediacy of this. Um, another one with some repetition here. What we call it, we have a tag on fonts and use for this uh, technique called crop and repeat. Um, I also like that a lot. Got some more smashed glass, some cut paper, um, kind of grungy, grungified type. Um, it's always really interesting to me when a designer can use one typeface in so many different kinds of ways and it still feels different in a different context. And I think Franklin Gothic and News Gothic are really good for that. They're, they have just enough personality to not be completely sterile and boring, um, but they are mutable enough that you can put them in different contexts and they still feel like they work. Um, so now we're going to like hit hyperspeed and I'm just going to blast through a bunch of random examples of uh, Franklin Gothic in use that if I had all the time in the world, I would be posting these every single day on fontsanduse.com, but I have to have a real life, so I'm just going to speed through them now and maybe uh, my colleagues will help me get to them eventually. Back to the point about Franklin Gothic being a very flexible typeface, uh, this quote from Alexander Lawson I think is uh, very relevant in that Franklin has been around and a lot of Morris Benton's uh, typefaces have been around forever. They've kind of uh, made it through decades of different fashions and still are being used in new and interesting ways. Um, so I'm going to pick up the pace here. This is a, a book that I like. This is the cover. It's basically a book that just has a bunch of like striped letters that you're meant to cut out and use in your like paste up design mock-ups. Uh, but the cover is just a very straightforward, all caps, Franklin explanation of how to use the book and what it does. And I just love it's that same, that's it, same like no nonsense, uh, straightforward approach that I like. But also, uh, this is kind of an art film. Uh, still looks great. I like when it's. Uh, I should say first of all, Franklin Gothic extra condensed, in all caps, set with like really tight spacing. It's like the pinnacle of Franklin Gothic existence for me. So you've probably seen a lot of that throughout these slides. It's a record I got when I was living in Amsterdam. I just like the colors. Uh, it's also sometimes interesting to see, I don't know, I have this huge file on my computer of all these images I've been saving of Franklin Gothic for, I don't know, I guess for this talk is why I've been saving them. <laughs> and so now I've been able to kind of piece together a, a few threads of, uh, related things. Um, this one example on the right, I'm, I'm not sure if this weird vibration effect is something that was like offered from a phototype setting house or um, if it was something the designer did themselves, but um, yeah, Frank got it. Blease stuff. Again, just straightforward, Franklin. Just said it, all caps, Franklin. Extra condensed, that's all you need. Uh, this is an interesting, I've seen a couple stencil variants of Franklin Gothic and I haven't really compared to see if they match or if it's like a kind of off the cuff thing the designer did, but I would be surprised if at some point someone had offered a, a stencil version. 
lots of cool science fiction paperbacks used Franklin Gothic, no surprise there. Also just kind of seedy, like Pulp Fiction, uh, stuff from the 60s. I um, really like the kind of bouncy baseline of this Vice Cop example, and I have a few other examples of something like that. This one I really like a lot. I was thinking about uh, making a version of Franklin Gothic that automatically would kind of bounce around like this. <laughs> Uh, this one's a small use, but it has that bouncy baseline. Uh, it's designed by Barney Bubbles. Um, I don't know, I just like the cover. I like how big this is and how it's kind of integrated in the photo. It helps uh, push forward this idea of giganticness. This one I think actually is a maybe a mix of ITC Franklin and normal Franklin. I can't, it's, the type's a little too small to see, but... Again, it's got this kind of like, it reminds me a bit of some of these designs you see often with uh, Futura Bold that are like mimicking Wes Anderson movies or something where it's kind of this utilitarian, everyday, uh, no-nonsense labeling. And I really, I don't know why, but this like makes me more interested than like some fine typography, expensive book. Only we'll order flyer, this is from Lawrence Wiener, who's, I wanted to put more uh, slides from Lawrence Wiener's work. He's an artist who works a lot with text and has used Franklin Gothic quite a lot. Um, it's Shirley Chisholm, who's uh, the first black woman elected to the to Congress and was also the first black candidate for like a major uh, nomination for president in the US. Um, she obviously didn't win for president, but I love her poster, I love her buttons, I love everything about it. All caps, Franklin, extra condensed, bring it on. I, again, I'm just kind of like pulling together different uh, themed content from, from my file of stuff. Um, I do want to give a special shout out to New York Magazine. Um, this is a fairly recent issue in the past few months. Um, and this is one of my favorite magazine covers. I guess it's probably not surprising now that you know how much I love Franklin Gothic. But uh, something that probably most people don't appreciate is the spacing. When you use the existing digital versions of Franklin Gothic to get this kind of tight spacing where you have very regular uh, space between clearances of each glyph, it's kind of a lot of annoying kerning work. Um, and I think they do a really good job over there. Also, they've been using Franklin Gothic for a while at New York Magazine, and I think they always are doing cool and interesting stuff. I, that magazine is probably my favorite magazine just for the design alone. Um, check it out if you haven't. Another magazine that has used Franklin quite well is Time. They've actually used a mix of different versions of Franklin. Uh, there's a, another typographic stock, actually, um, where uh, Carrie Mifsud is talking about using Franklin when she was working at Time, and she's now working at New York Times, but how she had to consult with uh, this guy, Kent Liu, who's uh, maybe the only other person who's nerdier about Franklin Gothic, and he knows all the different digital versions from all the weird ancient digital companies and which ones have which weights and italics and things like that. Um, but they mixed a lot of them for, for time when they were uh, still using Franklin Gothic. Quick aside for News Gothic, which, as we all know, is basically just Franklin Gothic light. Um, news, these, uh, specifically these bolder weights and tighter settings of News Gothic from uh, Pushpin Studios and Milton Glaser and kind of that whole uh, crew um, really kind of lit a fire under my butt to, to start thinking about making my own variant of Franklin Gothic that kind of had a news gothic aspect built into it. Uh, this one I thought was really cool. I, I really loved the super tight spacing of the headline, but then I also noticed that it's promoting an event uh, from the Cooper Union Alumni Association. Uh, so this is you know, like some kind of psychedelic ball or something like that. Uh, I don't know, but this this kind of tight lockup 
I, I really uh, I really enjoy that. And for some reason, it seems like in in the '60s there was like the the new bold version of News Gothic was released. I think it was in the '60s, and it was used in quite a lot of places. And there's some weird characteristics about it. Um, like the lowercase a has kind of the, the overhang is a little like weird, um, but it was always set really tightly. Maybe because it was introduced as a photo typeface, um, but it really I don't know. It, just, it looks great when it's set super tight like that. It's also the one on the left here. The accounting one has that similar kind of no nonsense, uh, straightforward vibe that I enjoy. I also like the uh, experimentation with the different. Um, quotation marks and the one on the right. I don't know what to say about this, but it's cool. <laughs> so I put it in. Same with these. This is just like a more news gothic stuff that I like. So that's kind of a, just like a, a blitz through just a fraction of my folder of cool examples of Franklin and news gothic and use. Complete step two of your <laughs> conversion to a Franklin monster. Step three is where it really starts going off the rails, though. Um, so as I've you know, been growing up with Franklin Gothic and loving it and collecting all these cool examples and kind of trying to use the versions that exist and wishing that there was something else, at a certain point I decided I was just going to give up and do it myself and make my own version of Franklin Gothic. Um, so that's what I'm doing. Um, and it started by kind of seeing things that I liked in historical design work that I wish there was a typeface that I could do a similar thing with, but there wasn't exactly the thing that I wanted. Um, and so this is kind of my checklist. There are a lot of different digital Franklins. I only scraped the very tip of the surface with ITC Franklin. Um, there's a version from URW. There's a version, I think, from Elsner and Flocka. There are all these versions. A lot of them seem to be based, or at least referencing, uh, the original ITC Franklin and ITC Franklin Gothic. Um, but there, I kind of, this is my checklist of things that I would want from my ideal version of Franklin Gothic. Um, and none of them check all of the boxes, which is why I decided, OK, I'm just going to do it myself. Um, I'm not going to read these out loud to you, but um, I'll, I'll explain most of the, the things as we go through. I should say, before I go on, though, that there are some digital typefaces that are based on either Franklin Gothic or News Gothic that are quite good and recommendable. Um, usually the reasons that I would use them or that uh, it wasn't enough that I had to make my own version it's because it, a lot of them kind of miss that original Franklin Gothic feeling, which I really um, hold dear to my heart. Probably the most uh, prominent example I can think of is Benton Sands. Benton Sands is a great typeface. It's a really great typeface. I've used it before, and it uh, is very usable, very flexible. There's a bunch of weights, a bunch of widths. The weights and widths are spaced. Uh, in very practical ways. Um, and it's no surprise that it's related to uh, Franklin Gothic because uh, the designer, Tobias Ferrer Jones, started with um, News Gothic as kind of the, the beginning. And of course, probably looked at all the other ATF Gothics as he was working on it. But you can really see it in the, in the lighter weights. It has a lot um, of a News Gothic kind of look to it. But when it gets into the really heavy weights, I think that's actually, it's. It's really cool. It's not Franklin Gothic, but it's its own thing, and I uh, I really appreciate that, and I like it. Um, Christian Schwartz, who I mentioned earlier, uh, his company Commercial Type worked on a custom version of Franklin Gothic for MoMA, um, which is also quite nice. It's slightly more regularized. It's got like a um, kind of a moving more in a Helvetica-ish direction. Things are starting to kind of close up more like Helvetica might. But it, it sets really well from everything I've seen. Um, unfortunately, it's an exclusive design. So if I wanted to use it for something, I just couldn't. So that's kind of uh, 
uh, uh, non-starter. Same thing with New York Times. I'm sorry I didn't get uh, a good example of showing. They have a custom version of their own New York Times, Franklin, which it was designed at least in part by Matthew Carter. Um, and it's uh, quite nice, especially the way they use it in some of their infographics and things like that. Um, I'm sorry to my friend Rumsey who works there and I've talked to about Franklin Gothic quite a bit that I didn't have a better slide to represent your usage here, but I'll make it up to you one day. Um, but again, New York Times Franklin, as you might imagine, is not something I can license and use for my own projects, so that kind of uh, cuts it out. I should also say, as you've heard me talk and talk about the extra condensed width of Franklin Gothic is probably at the top of the list of things I would need for any kind of Franklin-esque typeface to be, uh, to check all the boxes that I need. Uh, so another example is this typeface Balto, which again, is a really great typeface. I uh, especially like the ultra weights and the thin weight. Um, it has a lot of the same kind of uh, American Gothic flavor as Franklin Gothic. It's a little further removed than something like Benton Sands but it's in the same kind of general universe, um, and it's really well made. Um, I'm still trying to find an excuse to use that for something. Unfortunately, as far as I know, there's not a condensed uh, variant, or if there is, it's not on uh, the website of Type Supply, but um, yeah, another great typeface. Um, finally, there's uh, this company called, that is basically, um, taken up the trademarks of the American Type Founder Company uh, and have kind of restarted the American Type Founders Collection, I think it's called. And they have their own version of Franklin Gothic, which is definitely in the same kind of realm as Franklin Gothic, and I think it's also uh, very well made. Uh, my only issue with this, well, again, it doesn't have that extra condensed width that I really like, um, and it's slightly, um, slightly far removed from Franklin Gothic. And probably any of you looking at this slide are saying, what are you talking about? That's just Franklin Gothic. Um, but the, the, the ear on the G is a little bit too enthusiastic for me, and it's just slightly wide. I, I, I would prefer like a more of a narrow option. I, I, all the people that made these typefaces are my friends, so I hope they're not going to hate me for uh, critiquing their work publicly. Um, so this is X Franklin, which is the project that I'm working on. And it's basically, as you might imagine, kind of checks all the boxes that I showed earlier. Um, I want it to have a bunch of widths and weights, which it's now at least covers kind of uh, the standard uh, Franklin Gothic and a good chunk of News Gothic realm of width and weight. Um, I've been working on an extremely condensed version, which you maybe saw at the beginning or in the promo materials for this talk. Um, and I also have like an extremely light hairline. Um, but this is something that I'm kind of working on gradually uh, and selling it kind of as a work in progress through this platform called Future Fonts, which is great for a person like me who likes working on fonts sometimes, but then likes not working on fonts sometimes, and I can still sell them, and people still use them. Uh, actually, just today, a show closed at Grand Central Terminal that was using Hex Franklin. It was really, it's probably the m most public use of the typeface I've seen so far. Um, but I'm, I'm just, I don't want to make this like a marketing talk, but I want to like talk you through some of the ideas that I took from the stuff I showed before and, and brought into the design. One is this idea of multiplexing, which is essentially when the bolder weights, or basically any variant, matches the same width as another variant. So I could change the weight, and it won't make a headline break onto two lines. Or if I decide I just want to like slightly nudge up the weight of my body text, I can do that without being worrying about everything reflowing and not having to deal with that again. Um, I built it as a variable font, so I can really uh, have a lot of control over like very minute changes, but even the, the named instance instances that I'm offering as kind of normal static fonts um, are pretty, I have a narrow version, which is just slightly narrower than the normal, 
and I have a medium version which is just slightly heavier than uh, the regular and I don't even know if you can see the differences on this projection but they're the kind of things that I always wish for when I'm setting type especially when you have like a white type on a dark background and you want to just like slightly tweak the weight a little bit. Um, the other thing that's been really fun to work on and has been very much inspired by uh, some of the examples I've been talking about and showing is uh, this version where essentially I want to make it as easy as possible to set these very tight settings. I don't know if you've heard of TNT typography, but it comes from the era of ITC and photo lettering, and it stands for tight not touching, and it is what it sounds like, basically the normal rules of kind of rhythm and spacing that you would typically use for body type faces are completely out the window, and the focus is much more on getting a regular spacing uh, between the glyphs, as you can see here. And in fact, I uh, took the name from photo lettering, had a promotional, I think maybe couple promotional booklets where they were promoting this like you know tight type trademark service which essentially was just them like setting the tight tight tighter tight it's tight tight uh, I don't think it was anything special it was just a way for them to like this, this style was very much in fashion at the time of setting things extremely tight um, and as a way for them to say like hey look how cool this is it's like if you work with us, we can make your type look cool. Um, but I also like seeing this kind of application kind of out in the real world. Uh, this is a photo from my friend David Jonathan Ross in Washington, D.C. Um, and you see this a lot uh, also in the num numerous punk rock examples I didn't show you. There are examples that were set with letter set and the spacing was set very tightly like this. When, if you have just like a vinyl letter or a rub down letter, it's much easier to, to really cram the letters together as tight as possible. We also had a debate about whether this sign says is supposed to be read as the home of Jumbo Slice or home of the Jumbo Slice. <laughs> There's the jury's still out on that, but I like the uh, elevating quotation marks there. Um, so I made this version of my Hex Franklin, which um, um, so it's a variable font, and the concept is basically there are different sliders to adjust different kinds of spacing as well as the width. So one of the sliders just sets how tightly the spacing are. It's essentially like a tracking slider. But as you can see, some letters track at a different rate than, or some letter combinations track at a different rate. Um, if you have two straight up and down letters, they're going to change at a different rate than if you have two, you know, diagonal letters crashing into each other. Um, and then there's a not touching access, which basically allows you to uh, have the letters overlap or not overlap, uh, depending on your your taste in this very tight typesetting thing. Um, I should mention that this is, as you can see, it's just the extra bold weight. This is like for display uses only. Um, there is lowercase, um, but it's nice because it, uh, when you have this really tight spacing built into the font, you can do stuff like make websites with these extremely tight uh, headlines and you don't have to do any kerning. The, the, it's like a artificial intelligence built into the font um, to deal with those issues for you. So this headline, I set, I just set this. I didn't kern this at all. I just set it and tightened the spacing. Um, and it's really fun. It's really tedious to get it to work the way I want it to work, um, but it's fun to think about making a, a typeface that's normally, I mean, usually if you're making a kind of standard sans serif like Franklin Gothic, you try to make it as versatile as possible and you want it to work for small sizes and large sizes, but the idea of just throwing that all out the window and having this tight version, which is a completely separate font file, um, and then putting in all the bells and whistles that are specific to very large, very tight uh, display typography. So this is another example, like I just typed this and it, that's how it's set. Um, and again, like this isn't the way I would recommend like a student of type design to, 
to make their first typeface, though <laughs> some of them are inclined to do that. Um, but it also required a little bit of uh, trickery on my end to get, normally the side of the A and the side of the W don't always match up like perfectly like that. Like, is the W wider, the A is narrower. Um, so I had to kind of do some fudging within the typeface itself. But I think it's uh, it works well enough, especially in these contexts where you really see that if, if one of them was a slightly different angle, you would notice and it would, at least that's the kind of thing that to me is like having a pebble in my shoe is when you see that slightly off angle. Um, you may recognize this from one of the book covers I showed. Uh, I wanted to just build in these gigantic quotation marks. So these are glyphs in the typeface and they have a Unicode value for the uh, quotation mark ornament. Um, and you just type them and that's how they type up. You don't have to scale them up and change the baseline and deal with stuff like that if you want to have kind of cool big chunky quotes. Uh, similarly, this is like a very small, very display centric issue, but um, the standard design of Hex Franklin, the punctuation is larger than uh, the horizontal strokes and the letters, which is pretty typical for most typeface design. But if you're setting these gigantic extra tight uh, headlines, to me, I always like when things line up, especially when you have all this like very rigid, very closely spaced stuff. So I have a stylistic set that you can just turn on and again, like no kerning or messing around with baseline and sizing, and it just snaps everything to line up the way that you want. And of course, uh, when you're setting lines that are this tight, as one is to do with extra large Franklin Gothic, uh, sometimes the punctuation can be an issue. So again, I made another stylistic set that basically just bumps it up, and you don't have to mess with baselines and whatever else, and it's all like, very accurately aligned. So this is the, the tight version of Hex Franklin, which has been really fun to work on and it's been really fun to use. Um, there's a few other bells and whistles that I'll just go through real quickly. Um, some of the alternates that I saw in that alphabet showing with uh, the different versions of different letters, I'm starting to build in. So this is like an alternate lowercase g. I think I have an alternate lowercase a as well that's kind of a similar um, Structure, um, but this is something that I'm just to continue to work to work on. Um, you can buy it now if you want. Uh, it's now I've updated it I think two or three times, so it's not as cheap as if you had gotten in on the ground floor. But uh, if you buy a license now, whatever updates I do in the future, you get for free. That's one of the nice things about future fonts. Um, the other thing that's been really fun about and probably has been motivating most of my work about working on this uh, project, is basically using it to try to recreate all the cool designs that I see, but make them a little more tight or um, you know, put my own little spin on them. So some of these you may recognize from the stuff that I showed. Some of them are other things that I didn't manage to get in, in the slides with the time I have. Um, so it's just been really fun to use it, especially that tight version, which I used for the flyer for this uh, talk which I also made printed flyers out of. There's a stack here if you uh, want to take some home. Um, this is one of the flyers saying down the street from my house. Um, and with that, you have completed your transformation into a frantic Gothic monster. And that is the end of my talk.